Uh, hi everyone, welcome to ODO Fridays. I'm Ellen and I'm a community manager at the Open Data Institute. And I'm gonna welcome our speaker today, Mr. G, who is probably best known as uh, the Poet Laureate on the Russell Brown Show. And he's also one of the artists currently featured in our Data as Culture exhibition. For those of you in the room, if you would like to stay behind and join a tour with our curator, Hannah, of the current exhibition, you're very welcome to join us. A um, little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we'll save questions for the end. If you do have a question, please wait for me to come and bring you a mic. That's just so people watching on the live stream can hear you. If you are on the live stream and you have a question, then submit it on Twitter using the hashtag ODI Fridays. Um, and our talk today is going to explore whether we can find poetry in data. So I'll hand over to Mr. G. Okay, thank you very much, um, everyone in the room, those of you at home. Um, as has been said, uh, I go by the name of Mr. G and I am a poet. And um, my name's, the name I go by is Mr. G. Long story short, I was a big fan of Mr. T in the 80s. <laughs> Never quite got over the cancellation of that series and didn't really check much for the film, but you know, that's, that's on me. But some of you are probably wondering or asking yourselves, why have we got a poet in here that's going to talk to us about data? Like what could a poet possibly know about the world of data analytics and the artificial intelligence and the big algorithm in the sky? Um, believe it or not, I was not always a poet, and I'm willing to wager that many of you were not always working in the field of data. So obviously, upon our individual journeys, something has happened which has allowed the world of data to enter our lives, and what happened to you happened to me. Now, I did an engineering degree in manufacturing systems and that is the science of making things so I didn't start off being a poet I started off actually in the world of science and engineering um, which is why coming to this field is almost like me coming around full circle so I spent many of my university years going to factories discussing about the logistics of supply change trying to minimize work in progress and trying to come up with feasible and effective lead times that can allow a product to be made and if there are any other problems that interfere with that process that we can find a suitable rerouting and still allow the product to be made. And what I learned was, was that supply is paramount and supply is real and the supply has to meet the demand. But demand is dependent on our desires. And so even though supply is real, demand is a concept. So how did I go from being an engineering student to getting into the world of poetry? Well, this is a unique accident that, again, occurred in my life. I used to be a DJ, and so I used to like, you know, so working during the day, DJing during the night. And we used to put on these, um, like we call them PAs, where someone will come down and do some MCing, or someone will come down and do some singing. And it was part of the entertainment of the night. So just playing music and it would have a PA and it would be, you know, we're trying to supply entertainment to meet a demand of entertainment. One day, a certain individual came up and it was a Valentine's Day show. And he said that he wanted to propose to his girlfriend. So we were like, all right then, no problem with that. He then said that he wanted to read a poem. Now I'd never entertained the idea of someone reading a poem within a nightclub environment. I was like, what, we're gonna stop the music and then you read your poem, supposing the girl says no, you're gonna ruin my night, you know, mess my, mess my thing up, right? And so we just figured it's gonna seem completely out of place, but obviously, you want this to be done, and yes, it's a very nice gesture. How can we accommodate your needs? So, 
What we decided to do was, is we decided to create a fake poetry night. It wasn't a fake poetry night, it was a real poetry night, but the mindset behind it was that we would finish off with this gentleman reading a poem to his intended. So, there was about four or five of us, we all wrote poems in our different respective places at home, writing, 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 thinking what can we write, what can we write, what can we write, talking to each other, talking to each other, relaying information because we all had individual supplies that were going to meet at this one point that was going to fulfill a demand. As so it happened, we all formed together, we all did our poems, he then did his poem, got down on one knee, brought the ring out, she said yes, press a button, the balloons came down, everybody enjoyed the night. And then people said to us like, wow, you know, we really, really enjoyed the poetry. This is like, this is, this is enjoyable. This is an entertaining night out. And so I just started to think, wow, there is a demand here. And I've obviously got the need, sorry, I've obviously got the know-how to fulfill this need. And all it takes is just a little bit of organization, a little bit of thinking, what can I bring to this night that's going to make it unique, that's going to fulfill my audience's needs? And that's when I started getting into the world of poetry. So I started off thinking, okay, this is a nightclub environment. I'm writing for the nightclub. That is my audience. I'm trying to come up with things that are going to be as entertaining as the latest tune or entertaining as an MC or entertaining as a singer. And so that's where my style of poetry was spoken word. And so I spoke about things that were not way, way, way out in the sky, way, way, way out in the clouds and entertaining concepts that were just so far removed from reality. I spoke the language of the nightclub, which is what the nightclub demanded. And so this is one of my earlier poems, which I'm going to refer to later because it forms a part of the journey that led me to speaking to you guys. So this poem is called A Ticket to Fly, and it deals with what I call the strange fandango that some of us have to endure when we're going through airport security. I need to get away. I buy my online ticket today. My flight's booked down Montego Bay. I reach the airport stop. Doors slide open, Terminal 3. Check my bags away correctly. I reach airline security. Mr. Metal Detector, stop. No watch, no belt, no mobile phone. Remove my shoes in the required zone. No screwdriver, no ch bottle cologne. No hats, no coins, no stop. But my facial features fit the profile. Dark skin, dark hair, and dark brown eyes. And with the wrong surname, it's no surprise when the kettle meets the pot, it stops. Where you going to? Who's your next of kin? Are these bags packed by you? Can I look within? He's stroking the hairs on his chinny chin chin. I g -g 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 throw my apple juice in the binny bin bin. I realize he's got a job to do. He can't let all the terrorists step right through. And I don't want to see 9-11 part two. I've got nothing to hide. I've got nothing to prove. I flex any attitude. I can play with the rules and stop. But I don't want to know Guantanamo Bay or have my fingerprint info go astray. Have my profile fit someone else's face. My identity lost in the database. All I really wanted was a holiday. All I really wanted was a holiday. All I really wanted was a holiday. He gives me a smile, my paranoia fades, so I stop. I need to get away. I buy my online ticket today. When you travel abroad, just expect delays because we all want to feel safe when we board the plane. Full stop. Thank you very much. No need for applause, no need for applause. <laughs> I've had too much in my lifetime, too much in my lifetime, right? Yeah. But, very, very simple poem. The rhythm, the pace, the style is written for the nightclub, written for a nightclub environment. Little did I know that there are people who are studying in the data industry that are ruminating over this problem. And so through my exploration of a concept poetically, I then came to meet people that were exploring this through data analytics. And so you can... Watch a recording of that poem, it's called A Ticket to Fly, you can watch it on YouTube, and it's formed a part of the, the copy that display here at the ODI. So, I viewed poetry as being the right words for the right time. 
I don't try and airy fairy it. I don't try and take it into some magical, mystical realm. I just view it as being the right words for the right time. Now, in times of great occasion, people look to poetry. Weddings, funerals, christenings, times of quiet meditation, times of family gathering. People look for beautifully simple words to sometimes get them through ugly and difficult circumstances. Now, I can present to you words in so many different shapes and so many different forms. I can hand you all an unabridged dictionary that is full of all the latest words and their meanings in their current usage and form and their etymology. And I can hand you all the words and say, look, you like words? Bang, there's words. A whole heap of words for you. Enjoy. What are you going to do with these words? You're going to flick through? What's the meaning behind it? Or I can take the words that are within that dictionary and I can place them in a particular order to relay a particular understanding of a particular time. And if my understanding meets the time, I've hit you with the right words at the right time. And I can use poetry to capture a moment. I see many of you are now nodding your heads thinking, OK, I can see where this guy's going. Because as I said, I did engineering. And in my engineering degree, we had a module that was called Information Systems. And this was to do with the movement of information around the system in order to optimize the, the performance of that system. So again, I'm not going to claim to um, be a complete expert on this, but you know, I vaguely remember us drawing these different like logic gates and we found places where information is needed, where information is not needed. And we had little feedback loops that allowed you to find out certain bits of information. And what I realized was, or what I was taught, was that all the data had to be time stamped because it was only powerful and relevant when you knew what time it was. If a machine breaks down and there's dead time and we've got to work around it, I need to know when that machine broke down, how long it was dead for, when it got back up again and what we did to rectify the problem. You need to know these things. So in many ways, as much as poetry captures a time, data captures a time. Now, you've probably heard about the, you know, the information pyramid. That's another thing we were taught within the information systems module. So you have the information pyramid where at the bottom you have this huge trough of data. Data being unorganized, unstructured facts. Just facts, 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 facts piling along. And then one up from that pyramid is someone that then sifts through that data and says, okay, what of this can I use? And so that then becomes information. And then someone, I guess, evaluates the information and says, okay, what can I infer from this information? That then becomes knowledge. And then at the top of the pyramid is usually the person that can look upon the knowledge and make a decision that is informed, that can have an outcome on an unpredictable future. And that is what's deemed to be wisdom. Now, we were taught a weather scenario. The weather scenario being that you can look at the weather systems of the entire planet. We've got all the data to do that. Look at the weather system of the entire planet. Now, the smart man will figure, OK, right, we can look at the entire planet, but let's just focus on where we are right now. We're here in the UK. Let's look at the weather systems in the UK. Then the knowledgeable person will look at the weather systems in the UK and go, Hmm, looking at this, I figure out that I think it's probably going to rain all this week. And then the wise person will then say, all right, then let me just pack an umbrella. All right. But we're now in a place where there is so much data. There is so much information that's just buzzing around, buzzing around, buzzing around, buzzing around. And so we have got technology that is having an ever-evolving conversation with other technology about our behavior. And it's constantly updating itself, updating itself, updating itself, updating itself. And where this moves to, it's kind of hard to predict. Because the technology is becoming smart, it's becoming knowledgeable, it may be even be becoming wise. Now, there's lots of speak about the carbon footprint. 
and there's lots of talk about the digital footprint. And I see these are just two sides of the same person in the sense that our carbon footprint and our digital footprint are tap dancing it in the street. So whatever step you take with your carbon footprint has got a digital echo. And whatever step you take with your digital footprint has got a physical carbon echo. And with so many conflicting forms of data occurring in the sense that we are consuming data and emitting data, and these conversations are occurring between all of these technologies that are taking in our data, it's now harder to become smart, it's harder to become knowledgeable, and it's harder to become wise. And this is why I use the weather analogy, and I'll keep referring back to it, because as smart as we may try to be, we can't predict the weather too far into the future. You know, they might tell you a few days, they maybe even suggest next week, but nobody can tell you what the weather's going to be like at this time, this hour, this minute, this second, this day, a year from now. People can't do that. There's too many conflicting elements of data, too many things that can change. So it's trying to find a way forward. Now, poetry steps in at this precise moment. Because in my mind, that when you look beyond knowledge and when you look beyond wisdom, you then reach what I would call that unseen place, which is understanding. Understanding is an emotional process. It is your emotional connection to the data. It's you trying to take everything you've seen, swirl it around in your mind, and form an opinion. The opinion is always going to be subject to challenge, it's always going to be subject to debate, but at least you're taking it in and you're trying to form an opinion and you're trying to imagine what things will be like, what the weather will be like in a year's time, two years time, 20 years time, a thousand years time. And that's where you start entering the realm of poetry because a, poet, a poetical mind is born to handle such chaos. I was speaking to um, some of the, well, at the ODI summit, some of the data experts, and they were saying that data is, it's unorganized, it's unstructured, it's complex, and it's a nightmare. And I was like, well, that's, that, <laughs> that's pretty much a poet's life, right? <laughs> you know, right? That's what we're dealing with. If you think about it, poet, poets and artists are always trying to grapple with the concept of love. Now, if that isn't unstructured, unorganized, complex and chaotic, I don't know what is, but we still attempt to do it. And again, I use the weather analogy because we're obviously living in a time where climate change is a huge factor in terms of our considerations and in terms of how we move forward. We've got all these data conversations occurring. We don't know how far in the future we can look, but we have to take on board environmental considerations. I was employed to write a poem about climate change. And using my engineering brain, I sat down and I looked at loads of reports, I looked at for and against, and I tried to find a way in which how can I encapsulate all of these ideas within a simple poem that shows my understanding, but there's enough in there to let you know that this is actually quite data-based. And so I came up with this poem, which is based around the idea from Charles Darwin that life started in a warm little pond. And this poem is called A Drop in the Ocean. If we can take one drop of water from one drop of rain, we can see one drop of disorder that charts a planet's pain. If we can look within a single grain of sand, we can see the quickening desert that expands as it reveals our future plans that expands across the land. If we can have a single molecule of oxygen that's uncorrupted by the toxicants, isn't that the building block of our children's stock to be able to breathe air freely and not be coughing up? 
Can we chart a solitary snowflake? Cast its carbon foot on Swan Lake? Yet the warning of global warming is only courted when the storms break. We only take heed when the typhoons hit and the hurricanes blitz and the sea levels rise and fresh water runs dry. Amazon forests die and landfill sites pile sky high, yet somewhere amidst all the lies you can hear Mother Nature cry. Don't forget that this planet has its own biological clock. Nothing lasts forever, so don't demolish the lot. If life is indeed to be treasured, then let us treasure what we've got. For remember that all life started from just one precious drop. Thank you. Now, as was said in the intro, I was well known as being a poet that wrote poems for Russell Brand's radio show. I don't know how many of you listened to the show. There was a big scandal about 10 years ago. We all lost our jobs. It was a very merry, merry time. But <laughs> what I would do was I would sit and I would listen to the show and Russell and the co-host Matt would be talking, 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 talking. And my job was to write a poem that summarised everything at the end. And so I would sit there and I would just write things down that pertain to the show. So I'd just write maybe, oh, pin, oh, bouncing bellies, oh, boobaloo, right? You know, anything, right? And what I would then do was that as we got close to the end of the show, I would start to look at all these things and see through lines, things that I can talk about, things that are making sense, things that are having a story. And then as we got really, really close in the last 10 minutes, I would say to myself, what do I understand from this? And when I paused, then suddenly the poem would come. Now, if you listen to some of those poems, most of them are very, very abstract. They, they rarely deal with the absolute obvious. They're taking you somewhere else. Because as I said, I'm trying to gain an emotional attachment to the data that's provided to me, and I'm trying to come up with an understanding, and that understanding isn't just looking today or tomorrow. That understanding is trying to look way, way, way into the unknowable. In the same way that data is tending, it's not big data anymore, it's tending towards infinite. The mind and the imagination and the understanding of man has to also tend towards the infinite. This is what then brings me to when I was invited to come to the Open Data Institute and relay my poetical background into the world of data. You see, I'd already been thinking along these lines anyway. And so when I came here, I had the poem, A Ticket to Fly, and I met people that were working in the airline industry that are trying to deal with the idea of racial profiling. I met people that were designing the, the timetables for the, the West Yorkshire bus route. Big up ODI Leeds, right? You know? <laughs> but, um, but what I'm saying is that, like, is that when you sit down, and, when I sat down and spoke to many people that worked deep, deep, deep within data, right? M removing aside the, the mathematics and the optimization and the big data and the talks of the database, I realized that, wow, you're trying to solve a problem and trying to find all the data that can lead you to solve this problem and come up with an understanding. That requires sometimes looking at it all, stepping back and just going, okay, what's it, what exactly is going on here? Because sometimes the data itself does not provide all of the answers. The poem that I did, Ticket to Fly, deals with racial profiling at airports. Now, one thing I have noticed from reading some of, some of the literature that provides me by the ODI, and I read um, was it, um, that book, The Digital Ape, uh, is that, let's say if we were to look at a company that has had old white men in the boardroom for its entire existence, and then we looked at the achievements of that company, we could then come up and say, okay, based upon the past data of what's worked well in this company, old white men are probably the best people to run this company. And that's when you get the situation whereby you've got this data and you've come up with information, you created a sense of knowledge, and you are in your mindset making a wise decision. So when a young person comes in, it's like, oh, I think you need a few more years, mate. 
when a woman comes in, it's like, I don't really know if this job's quite for you. When a person of colour walks in, it's like, hmm, I think we'll start you off in this position here and we'll see how it goes. And you are making what you deem to be informed decisions, but you need that poetical mind to step back and try and form an understanding of what is leading me to look for this data? What is leading this data to create these decisions? What is happening? Because we can't see too far into the future. We can only hope into the future. Hope, like desire, like demand, like poetry, these are concepts. These require a different type of thinking. So, I got invited into the Open Data Institute and I was looking at all this stuff and they wanted me to talk about data in a way that was, I suppose, translatable. And in the same way in which I tried to create poems that worked in the nightclubs in Brixton, I thought, can I create poems that work within a data summit amongst data experts? And so this was one of the poems that I wrote, which it basically deals with the ideas of open data, meaning the data with which we share with the world and the way in which we can try and use the sharing of that data to try and create a better world. So there's an element of hope within this poem. So this poem is called Just Data. Is there more to me than just data? Does information rule the highways of my life? Can I find a place amidst the ones and the zeros to steward my thoughts, to create and decide? Surely there's more to me than just data. Will its transparency affect me online? Let he with cleared history cast the first stone, for I'm sure there's a few things it would all rather hide. So where do I stand in a world of just data? With knowledge of an oil field slick corporate device, can I exist in the ignorance of a wasteland or reap the harvest that a farmland provides? And what decisions will be made with just data? Will they result in an advantageous design? Are we to be forever tied to the old posts of one's race or one's gender? Or will it propose new ways to divide us in tribes? So who am I? Who am I? Am I the movies I've never seen? The house I'll never buy? the money spent on smoothies, my lack of exercise? Am I my social interactions, facing a jury of my peers, those to whom I trust to share my secrets, those to whom I trust to share my fears? How can we activate the levers to mature beyond such fears, where the learning of our leaders allows innovation to reappear? How can we validate achievement to release an openness of mind? For no seed can ever bloom in darkness. For it to grow, it embraces light. So let us have patience as we learn to love data, to be capable of new engagements and trust. We'll steward, create, and decide on such data and let it enlighten us, provided that it's just. Thank you. So that was a poet attempting to enter the, the deep murky world of data and emerge with something that was artistic and I have to admit it's been a very very um it's been a very I suppose yeah enlightening journey and it's allowed me to use that old engineering side of my mind that I sort of like put away for such a long time and sort of like marry the two and so to me I don't see a difference between innovations in data and innovations in writing. I don't see um, differences between imagination and how you would want to, to use data to try and solve problems and your imagination, how you want to use poetry to tackle concepts. It's all about trying to form a sense of understanding. Now that is what brings me to this wonderful project, which has been, yes, it's been a, um, it's been a journey in itself. This strange projection here is of a digital art piece that I conceived that is called Bring Me My Fire Truck. Now, believe it or not, 
This started off as a poem about Brexit. I know I said the B word. I've done really well. I've done really well. How long have I got? Well, I've, done, I've gone in half an hour now. I haven't, made, I haven't mentioned it. Do you know what I'm saying? Right? But that's what it started off as. It started off as a poem about Brexit. I mean, like, I think like, like many people, whatever your persuasion is, Brexit has been one of the, um, the most interesting occurrences. <laughs> See that choice of words there? Yeah, very good, right? You know, in our lifetime. And so I was thinking, okay, how, how can I make sense of this? I'm just trying, so I'm trying to write things and it's, uh, it's a bit too contrived. Trying to write this, uh, a bit too, no, I'm not, I'm not quite feeling that. And the narrative is changing, 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 much like the weather patterns, changing, 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 changing. You can't quite get a grip on it. You can only really look a few days ahead. You can't predict what's happening a few months ahead, a few years ahead, a few centuries ahead. All you can do is just say, well, all these things are happening and we know things are happening. Let's try and find an understanding of a way through it. Now, there was a, um, a remit that was given to me by the Open Data Institute where they were bringing an exhibition that was called Copy That. It was actually, we had the meeting in this room, didn't we? Right, where we, where we spoke about it. And the remit was talking about the idea of copying data and how you can have a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy and how can a copy retain its value and how can we try to minimize flaws and discrepancies and so people are standing where I am now giving talks about trying to get you know you know precise copies and worrying about different um, anomalies that might occur here anomalies that might occur there because it was all about trying to get things so 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 precise right obviously I'm sitting here as a poet just thinking well I don't really work in the world of precise and looking at what's happening on the news, I don't think anybody else is working in the world of precise either, right? And so I'm trying to figure out this poem about Brexit, and I'm listening to all these things about trying to make things precise, and I was just thinking, maybe the answer isn't about being precise. Maybe the answer is about embracing the flaws and the discrepancies and the differences within each other. And so I thought to myself, if I think about it, as an artist, all of the innovations within art have occurred through some kind of a mistake, some kind of a deter deterioration, some kind of a discrepancy, some kind of a shift from the norm. Sometimes something occurs and then people say, OK, this is the mainstream. We want to create the underground. The underground then becomes a mainstream and new underground occurs like there's a constant flux and movement an ebb and flow of beautiful chaos. And from that, innovation emerges and then when you think about the way in which again when I used to have these logic gates doing the information systems and just plotting where the, 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 the stamp of it is you always know that chaos is about to emerge that's always in the the mindset that something is going to go wrong it's the whole sod's law Murphy's law however you want to you want to put it right and so you can actually incorporate that you can actually allow for that when we used to do design technology we talked about the different talks and the different tolerances nothing is ever going to be precise so sometimes aiming for precise causes the imperfection again I'm coming back to this right so I thought about poetry and um, if I can't write a poem that works for Brexit Maybe somebody else can write a poem that's going to work brilliantly. And I thought to myself, what is a poet who I love and I admire and I'm inspired by? I'm a big William Blake fan. Big, big, big William Blake fan. And um, I, I, I love the restlessness. I love trying to make sense of change. I love the idea of trying to speak to the divine within yourself and use that to uplift everyone. I love those ideas. This poem is known as Jerusalem and did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green. Most people know this poem as being the song. It's a song people sing. They sing it at rugby matches, they sing it at um, cricket matches. It's known as the unofficial English national anthem. What could be more English than William Blake's poetry, right? I would slightly disagree in the sense that the poem and the song I think it was 1810, something like that, around that region, right? And the song was written, like, about 100 years later. 
So you could actually say that the song is an evolvement or a de-evolvement of the poem because the meaning of the poem changes once it becomes a song. And so the feelings of the poem change once it becomes a song. So this which we hold to be so dear and so quintessentially English is a change. So any, anyone that tries to fight against the path of change, what is, it, is, it, is it the law of thermodynamics? The entropy of a system will never decrease, it will always increase. The change of a system will always increase. You can't stop change, right? That's a physical law. So this has now changed. But people hold this up to be quintessentially English. I'm trying to talk about Brexit. Brexit, ideas of patriotism, ideas of nationality, ideas of belonging, ideas of what does it mean to be British? What does it mean to be English? What does it mean to be from London, from Manchester, from Liverpool, from Brighton, from Plymouth? What does it mean? What do these things mean to us? And so I figured that, okay, let me run this through Google Translate. <laughs> Again, don't question the mind of a poet. <laughs> Just accept it, right? <laughs> Ran it through Google Translate, and I just picked lots of different languages, right? And I think, oh, people are worried about um, folks coming in from Poland. Right, let's, let's run it through Polish and see how it comes back. And as I ran it through and brought it back, it was changing. And it was changing. And I just thought to myself, oh, wow, this is interesting. And I thought about the, um, the talk that was given here about the idea of copying and trying to, to minimize the discrepancies. And I'm realizing, wow, we've got those discrepancies here. Let me just run it backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards through Google Translate. And I started to realize that the poem was just shifting and changing. It, it almost became a living, breathing thing, right? And I thought, wow, some of these are really, really funny. Really, really, really funny, right? Some lines that were innocent became sinister, right? And, and some lines that had no meaning in the 18th century, right, have a meaning in the 21st century. And so I was like fascinated by this thing. But how can I take this data and present it in a way in which it's going to be palatable and a way it's going to be understanding? And so I thought Airport Arrivals Board. Right? As you do. So what, <laughs> what I've created is, is a, this is a, a, a digital art piece whereby we take William Blake's poem and countries are arriving to the wonderful land of the UK and they are bringing with it their own translations of the poem. So we would have, let's say, um, Athens would arrive bringing Greek. The poem would then go into Greek and then come back into English. Certain lines would change. Uh, we would have Italy arrives. That translation then goes into Italian, then comes back into English. Right? And so as new arrivals come in, um, I used the languages of the, that are spoken within the EU, the main languages, and we've included um, Welsh and we've included Scots Gaelic. Um, because I, I guess this is an English poem, so I figured that, like, okay, you know, the, the Scots crew, they, they might want Burns, so I figured, like, you know what I mean, let's just stick to that. And, um, and it was amazing how the poem starts to shift and starts to change and starts to recreate itself. And I just thought, if there's anything that can be the best understanding of Brexit for me, it is this confusion, right? So... What's interesting is, is that the two words that remain the same through all the translations are England and Jerusalem. Everything else just starts flipping. So um, I'm just going to read, um, and the reason, why, sorry, the reason why it's called Bring Me My Fire Truck is that when you ran it through German and came back, <laughs> Bring Me My Chariot of Fire <laughs> became Bring Me My <laughs> Fire Truck, which I just thought was the funniest thing ever. And I just said, right, that's going to be the name of the piece. And working with the ODI team, working with Hannah, working with Julie, um, we, we sat down and just figured out what's the best way to, to show it, what's the best way for it to have the feel of a, of a, a departure board within a, um, an airport. And when we showcased it at the ODI summit, what's very interesting is I was standing there, like literally standing here, getting ready to explain it to people. What was really interesting was that 
people are pre-programmed to just stare at departure boards. Right? <laughs> like people just stand there and just go, oh, oh, pl oh, plane's coming in from Berlin. Oh, that's nice, right? <laughs> and then they're just looking and they went, oh, oh, whoa. Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, right? And, um, and so it was just amusing. And then I have to explain to them exactly what's happening. And once they figured out what's happening, it goes, oh, well, oh, yeah, that's clever, that's clever. And then you want to see more translations and more translations. And so this is one where it just says, and the adults will stay, go to the green hills of England, and here is the Lamb of God. In England, we see a beautiful meadow. And me, go to the dark mountains. Is Jerusalem built here? In these dark hills? Add a gold ring. Small arrow. I understand the cloud. Wine! I do not want to stop the fight. The funeral is over. Although we never came back to Jerusalem, green and comfortable in England. That was bringing my fire truck. What was really interesting is that I remember at the summit, this, this guy just looked at me and he just goes, I understand the cloud, right? No. <laughs> Again, a phrase that would have, had, would have had no real true meaning two, three hundred years ago has got a huge meaning now, right? And that's why I think that like the, the poetry world and the data world, they can combine because they are both trying to achieve the same thing, which is a sense of understanding. And I think that I'm always trying to encourage everyone to be a poet. So this is my, this is my poetry advertisement right now, right? You know, um, not everyone is a great poet, myself included, but everyone has got a great poem inside of them, right? And so I could then flip it and then just say, not everybody's going to be a great data analyst, <laughs> but there will be moments where you will be able to analyze the data with an immense sense of understanding, an immense sense of comprehension, and be able to see things that other people can't. And that's really what we're trying to achieve because we've got this whole vat and glut of information, information, information that is man-generated. We've got all of these man-made problems and I always think that like if there's a man-made problem, there has to be a man-made solution, right? Has to be. And so within this glut of this data, there's got to be a way in which we can solve hunger, we, we can solve poverty, we can solve all of the problems that are afflicting us in terms of even climate change, the, the movement of resources, right? We can solve all these problems by applying a mind, but sometimes that mind has to break away from that which previously was. And that's the beauty of poetry because you're looking to break away from that which previously was. And the poetry and the data combined, in my opinion, is the future. So the future isn't orange, the future is data poetry. Okay, thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, um, then I'll, I'll be willing to, um, to answer them. Thank you, so thank you so much, that was really interesting. Uh, are there any questions to start with? Any? Uh, yeah, wait for the mic. Okay, okay <laughs> well, here we go. Yeah. Cool. Yes, uh, my name is Piano. Is it on? Yeah, it's on. It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not Don't to worry. make it loud in here. Yeah. It's for outside. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so how do you collect your own data in terms of the words you want to use, like you did on the Russell Brand radio show? Do you have them in a long line? Do you have them all around in a mind map? Or oh, it's how, pure how chaos. Do you? No, for me, I, I, I love the idea of things being completely unstructured and completely chaotic. So the way I look at it is that Everything that, everything that you find of interest is a reflection of you. I've got this belief, okay, I'm gonna get really weird now, right? <laughs> I've, I've got this belief that, that before you were born, you know everything. The moment you were born, you forget everything. And then you spend the rest of your life just trying to remember. And so there's a reason why you might look at a, you know, a red suit and go, wow, yeah, I like that red suit. That red suit's me, right? You know? Or you might look at a purple suit and be like, oh, I don't really like that. Because you always liked the red suit. It was always there for you to like. And so anything that I find interesting or anything that I find attractive or even repulsive, anything that creates an emotion, I make a note of it. I just make a note of it, just think, okay, then right, that's, that's interesting. And so from compiling all that, 
I then find an understanding. So there are some people that are listening to what I'm saying right now and they might just pick one thing. That's the thing for you. Everything else you can actually dispel with, right? That's the thing for you. Because again, it's trying to take the idea of data and turn it into information. We can't consume everything, right? We can only consume tiny little bits. So if you have a, a realm of study, a realm of um, interest that pertains to you, then delve into the data within that, and then you will be an expert within that. And so again, the, the mindset that creates poetry is the mindset that's very good for analyzing data. Hi, Carol Tello. Okay. You talked about um, creating order out of chaos. Yeah. And again, just thinking of the Russell Brand um, example. Right. Um, those of us who work in data, we're often um, trying to um, find what's authentic and when we capture that data, and then we might move on, it might evolve. And of course, you're making um, order out of chaos, but you're creating fixed records, aren't you, that aren't going to evolve. So the poems that you read out to us are captured for all time. You're not going to go back and tinker them with them, are you? So I just wondered how you felt about um, that, that sort of creating that sort of eternal record that is always going to be part of your work um, for all time. Um, well, I think you're, you're right in the sense that, like I would say that um, po poetry is the right words for the right time. And in the same way in which, again, going back to the, the, the logic gates, all the data was time stamped. So it, what works on Monday might not necessarily work on Tuesday. What happens in summertime may not happen necessarily in wintertime. The poems that you write, they just capture a certain feeling in a certain moment at a certain time. You then evolve, the world then evolves. Some poems, you write them in the morning, they're useless in the evening. Some poems, they might hold a relevance for a couple of years. Some poems might hold a relevance for a couple of hundred years. In my opinion, no poem is going to hold relevance for eternity because that's the dream, isn't it? So time is, time is your friend, it's not your enemy, right? It just allows you to then see what then occurred in this period of time and how people were thinking and then people have a different ways of thinking and then people have different ways of thinking. If you want to know um, what happened in terms of facts and figures, you look to history books and you just say, okay, this happened in 1945, this happened in 2012, this happened in your feeling at that time. The date doesn't tell you that. The art, the sculpture, the words that people produce, that's what tells you, oh, this is how people felt in 1945, this is how people felt in 2012, this is how people are feeling in 2020, all right? So time can be your friend because it allows you to form an understanding which is always going to be incomplete and it's always going to be biased because you bring with you your own prejudices through the door. Wherever you go, there they are with you, right? But hopefully understanding can be, it can be challenged and you can sometimes challenge the writings that you wrote years ago. I look at some of the stuff I wrote and be like, man, that was like, <laughs> what was I thinking? I don't know what was going through my brain right then, right? But that's, I think that's the, the beauty of the evolution of the human spirit. Yeah. When you were creating the artwork, yeah. you were sort of immersing yourself in stuff going on in the world <coughs> around data yeah. and sort of what people were saying about it. How do you think that kind of world is at communicating itself and kind of gaining an understanding of itself? Like, how good are, are organizations or different setups um, at kind of talking about what's important and drawing an emotional connection to those things. Okay, well, I think this is, okay, this is, I've only been in this world for about a year, right? So I don't want to come up like I'm that's some big expert, right? No, you know? That's why it's important. But like my understanding of open data, I found that, I found that very, very interesting, right? The idea that you make companies completely transparent in the sense that the way in which we interact with these companies, either you know, via our phones or on the high street or via laptops, we're being completely transparent with them. Why can't they be completely transparent with us? And I remember just thinking to myself, I remember having conversations with you know, people in the ODI and they're telling me about, oh, data's gonna become open. And I'm just thinking, 
you're, you're, you're trying to ask companies to forego hundreds of years of skullduggery and clandestine practices and, you know, hiding secret recipes and stuff like that, right? You're trying to, you're trying to get them to, em, to emerge from this, like, shadowy, you know, under the troll, under the bridge, um, and then cross over to the other side. I don't know if you're going to be able to do that. And again, people say, well, look, it's inevitably going to happen because there is so much data on so many companies that if you actually want to find out these things, you can find out these things. So you may as well, in order for companies to create a new business model and be able to interact with each other into the 21st, 22nd, 23rd centuries, they're going to have to adopt this anyway. And I realized that, wow, your industry is fascinating because you're not thinking, you're thinking so far ahead into an unknowable future and you're thinking, okay, this is the trend that's going to have to happen anyway. Let's try and find a way to ease the old mind into the new mind. That's where you need art, right? Because art can make very complicated things very, very simple. You need, you need simple words and simple ideas to allow people to get a peek at that which is completely, you know, crazy. And I think that, like, that's why I see the two going hand in hand. And I, I was very, very good conversations with people. And I'm just, I can, I can see it happening. I mean, I've been sold on the idea now. I've been sold on the idea of open data. And I've been sold on the idea of, like, how the way in which we interact with each other because we're interacting with each other digitally in a way which we don't interact in the physical world so there's already this change in our behavior with what happens online affecting us offline and what happens offline affecting us online that's already behaving it's changing our behavior and so it's um it's just going to take a a massaging of egos a massaging of corporate egos just a little just a little a little massage saying don't worry, man. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. You don't worry. You know, you're, you're still the big boss, man, right? You know what I mean? And I think that's, that's what you're facing. Um, and, you know, if, if I can find ways to, like, when I sit down and, and think about it, if I can find ways to, to, to really bring it together, then, um, yeah, I feel like I've done my job. You know? Any more? I've got a Okay. Quick one. Okay, I'm going uh, to finish on a poem, right? So, yeah. Okay. Uh, I was just wanting to know, so you've covered things like racial profiling, Brexit, and that with your poetry. What area would you want to explore next in this kind of data poetry space? The area... Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the area I'd like to, um, to, really, to really, I suppose, delve into is that every... There's a, th there's a thing, called, you know, is it, is it, I think it's resonance, where everything's got a vibration, right? And so when your vibration matches the vibration of the thing that you're looking at, then you're in harmony. And so every industry I've been in, whether it's been in radio, whether it's been in performing, whether it's working in the engineering world, um, speaking to journalists, I work a lot in the prison system, I work a lot in school system, every industry has its own vibration of how it is they get through what it is they're trying to achieve. And I think if I can tap into that and create poems that translate that to the lay person, because I'm still Mr. G from the nightclubs in Brixton, right? I'm still that guy. And I'm always thinking to myself, how can I relate the things I'm thinking of that are going to work on that stage so that people can just go, Oh, yeah, 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 he's got something there. He's got something there. And I realised that in, in the same way in which um, I am taking in data and trying to create poetry, the poetry itself is now creating data. Um, I'm just going to finish on this... Whoop, I'm just going to finish on this poem, which was written... It was written on the spot backstage at the ODI Summit. And um, I had a, you know, a great conversation with um, Nigel Shadbolt. He was talking to me about his book, The Digital Eight and artificial intelligence and um he was talking about the idea of open data open data open data and tim berners lee was there and they were both telling me that this is the future and you've got to you've got to look past the old way of doing things right and i was thinking to myself has there ever been a time when we've employed open data in the past because surely 
Nothing is new under the sun. And so whatever it is we're trying to do, it must have existed in some way or shape before. See, this is how a poet thinks, mm -hmm. right? And so I wrote this poem, which is based around my understanding of the true history behind open data. So this poem is called The Open Hand. Back in ancient times, before the advent of mega metropolises that concentrated our want, people lived in more isolated existences, closed systems. Some people lived up in the mountains, others down in the valley. Some lived within the forests, others amidst the fields. Some people lived alongside the river, while others existed deep within the heart of the dry desert. But no matter where people lived, trade knew no boundaries, and ideas have cared little much for borders. So a word from the mountain will eventually reach the valley, and a recipe from the forest will one day be tasted in the field. These early steps in an idea of openness had to emerge to allow people to interact. Shared systems. Thus, a recognized code of practice will inevitably develop to massage this flow of new ideas. Now, some people say that the simple handshake was popularized in ancient Greece. Others say that it was in Yemen. It was a basic way for traveling tradesmen and soldiers to show each other that they were unarmed. This willing display of an open hand has evolved to symbolize a gesture of goodwill, an agreement, even a plea for forgiveness. Hello, nice to meet you. Agreed, do we have a deal? Let's shake on this. I have no weapon. I'm sorry. Can we be friends? Even the phrase, playing with an open hand, signifies that we must put all our cards on the table. And an unwillingness to do so could be construed as a sign of distrust. And it is this distrust that will send us back to our mountains, back to our fields, back to our forests, and back to our deserts, and back to our isolated existences with not an open hand, but an empty one. I think that's gonna be the end of it for me. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you again. And just a reminder, if you do have time to stay for the art tour, then uh, Hannah, a lovely curator, is here to guide you around. And if you're at home and would like to come in and see some of Mr. G's pieces in the office, then you can book through our website, I believe. Uh, if you search data as culture, then you should be able to find that information. Okay. Thank you.